I'd start with just the general background. Uh, who are you and what's your professional background with this chimp business? Okay. So my name's Jen Firestein. Um, I've worked with chimps since 1998. Um, I started at Yerkes Primate Center, which is a research laboratory in Georgia and was there for about five years. And that really opened my eyes to a lot of the issues with using chimps and other non-human primates in captivity and biomedical research. And I got an amazing opportunity to work for Dr. Carol Noon at Save the Chimps. And so I joined her and um, learned a huge amount from her and spent 13 years at Save the Chimps. And then I worked for a couple of years with Project Chimps in North Georgia. And now I am not in the chimp world anymore officially. I'm working um, for an animal shelter, doing more human resources and administrative type work, but I love staying connected with the chimps. Cool, yeah. And I don't remember how you got connected to Carol. So I had emailed her, and I don't even remember why, but I had emailed her um, asking to visit uh, Save the Chimps in New Mexico right after she took the Colston took over the Colston Foundation. I really wanted to see the Colston Foundation for myself um, because everyone talked about how horrific it was and I suspected that most labs were more or less the same and I kind of wanted to see for myself how bad it was. And she um, invited me to come there and I spent a few days volunteering and just helping clean enclosures and make enrichment and work with the chimps and she invited me to come work for her, so I did, yeah. Yeah, and <clears throat> probably most people who are going to watch this realize that like the sanctuary community in North America is pretty small, and so we all kind of know each other. Mm -hmm. I was trying to remember earlier when you and I met, um, and it was when you were still working at Yerkes. I think it might have been mm, right after I graduated from um, grad school at Central Washington University in or maybe the first year I was working at Fauna, because I know you had also visited Fauna while I was there, too. Yeah, I went to Fauna for the first time in, I think it was 2000. That's probably when I first met you and JB. All right, well, that's good for a little bit of background. Yeah. So what other sanctuaries have you kind of consulted with, with the introductions or other aspects of sanctuary care? Um, I mean, I've worked a little bit with Center for Great Apes. They're a chimp and orangutan sanctuary in Wachula, Florida, run by Patty Reagan. Um, I did some intros with Angel, one of the chimps rescued from um, entertainment several years ago when a trainer was shut down, Sid Yost. Um, I helped her with some intros there, and I've gone and spoken to her staff about introductions. Um, but they, you know, the pet chimps really are their own specialty. Um, they're much more challenging, the pet and entertainment chimps, and, and they do pretty well integrating those chimps who have their own set of challenges. Um, and then I worked with Project Chimps for a couple of years, but more on the administrative side. I didn't do too much um, with introductions. And, and Center for or, um, Chimp Sanctuary Northwest is really the one that I've done probably the most work with recently. I'm very yeah. happy to. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So right now I know you're um, working at, is it Humane Society Naples or Naples Humane Society? Yeah, Humane the... Society Naples. Yeah. Everyone wants to call <laughs> okay. it the other way, but it's Humane Society right? Naples. So yeah. So doing human yeah. resources. So still working with primates, <laughs> just in a, in a different <laughs> aspect and a different way. Right. I'm sure there's a lot of similarities. <laughs> <laughs> there can be. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we really appreciate you traveling up all the way from Florida um, to help to help with our process. And we had talked with you when we were first doing intros um, with the Honeybee Willie and Mave when they first came, and we were trying trying to introduce them to the group of seven who came in two thousand eight. And obviously, that didn't work out. No. So, unfortunately, <laughs> that, does, that happens. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. What's your guess for the success rate for, for introduction processes? Because I know you've been in, involved in a lot with um, Save the Chimps. There was a lot of chimps that were living singly. Is that right? And yeah. then you really created a lot of larger groups in order to move them to Florida. 
Yeah, I wish I, you know, in hindsight, I wish I had kept better data and better records on our intros. Like at Save the Chimps, we were so focused on get them intro, get them into groups so we can get them to, into Florida and out of this laboratory environment. So um, we really didn't keep good counts or data on on outcomes. It was just, it works great. It didn't work. All right, let's try somebody else. Um, but I would say, you know, subjectively seems probably at least 90% work out in the end okay, and maybe 10% don't, and you have to find other options for those particular chimps. Um, but overwhelmingly, I found that they are successful. Um, and we've only had a few, really a small number of chimps who ultimately couldn't get along with nearly anyone. Um, maybe they only had a couple of chimps they were comfortable with, and then one chimp out of the 266 that saved the chimps, actually 325 over the years who didn't get along with anyone. So um, most chimps can find their way in a group. Um, you just have to keep trying, and it's a lot easier when you have 300 chimps to choose from. It's right. Much more challenging when it's a small number of chimps who are available. Right. And do you feel like there's an ideal group size for chimps in captivity? Not necessarily. Um, you know, at Save the Chimps, our average group size ended up being about 21 chimps um, living on these fairly large um, islands. But, you know, I've seen successful groups that are smaller. And I know there are groups, especially in range countries, range sanctuaries, in Africa who maintain larger groups. So um, I don't really know how I would even define ideal, to be honest. I mean, there's a huge variety of community sizes in wild chimps as well. So you just have to work with the space and number of chimps you have and try to give them compatible groups. Right, yeah, that's a good point that it varies so much even in, in what we've been able to observe in, in wild chimps. And you mentioned earlier the differences um, and some of the challenges with different uh, origins of the, the chimps. So at Center for Great Apes, they work with a lot of chimps who have been privately owned or used in the entertainment industry. Um, and I know that <clears throat> sometimes with those chimps, the smaller groups tend seem to tend, work a little bit better. Do you think that's true? I mean... We have, I'd say the chimps, we were successful in getting former, you know, pet and entertainment chimps into the larger groups, but it did seem to be a lot more of a challenge. Um, so um, I can see why sometimes smaller groups, particularly of groups of only pet and entertainment chimps, end up being more successful. Um, for us, we had a lot of chimps from biomedical research and also chimps who were wild born who could kind of help guide um, these chimps who really just don't know how to be chimps. They don't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, you know, from my experience working with um, the group of chimps at Central Washington University who had been reared by humans um, and Washoe initially was only around humans. Um, you know, the whole experiment there was teaching them sign language and, the idea of like how do they learn how to communicate with other chimps when they haven't been around chimps and that's so much a part of like how they're going to get along with one another right exactly so and then you think about the entertainment chimps who are taught facial expressions that you know may mean one thing in entertainment may mean happiness and in other in chimp world actually means fearfulness or even aggression and so they aren't necessarily going to be able to predict how other chimps are going to react or read other chimps' facial expressions. And it's, it's like them learning a whole new language, um, truly. Right. So, um, obviously there's, a, there's different ways of approaching how to do intros, like the actual, like step-by-step -step process of, of how to do things. And I think experts, there aren't that many experts in this. I don't know. 
I don't know if you consider yourself an expert in introing chimps. You are, obviously have a lot of experience, so I would consider you more expert than most people. Um, and there are really just a handful of, of people who have done this a whole lot. And there, there isn't a lot that's written about it. There are some research papers. So what's your process and why did you kind of land on the way that you do things? Well, I learned my process through from Dr. Carol Noon. So, and it was the process that she relied upon. Um, she did some. She did her PhD um, dissertation on some integrations um, at Chimpunchi in the Zambia, and so she relied on the dyadic one-on-one -on -one process. So, her approach was introducing chimps to each other individually before integrating them into a larger group. Um, and her, you know, philosophy on it was that it's a little bit easier to try to navigate establishing a relationship with one individual chimp. Um, if you are a chimp who doesn't know any other chimp in a group, integrating a bunch of chimps together at once, it's a lot more complicated. Um, and they do have, they have the brains for it. I mean, chimps are designed to navigate really complex social environment. Um, but she just felt like, you know, from their perspective, just getting to know each other one at a time was the, the easier, um, and perhaps safer approach. Um, but there are other approaches. Um, and I know other, uh, facilities, zoos and sanctuaries successfully use more of a group integration approach. So taking small groups of chimps who already know each other and putting those two groups together. And that has also successfully resulted in um, happy, you know, social groups. So there isn't really a right way or a wrong way, I don't think, to do it. It's just the way we as humans are comfortable with and um, also the way that we feel the chimps we work with are going to best respond um, to those situations. So, and I'm also not 100% like, oh, everything has to be one-on-one. -on -one. Like you can't start with a group scenario. I've had chimps who were more comfortable um, meeting new chimps if they had a buddy by their side. So we would do small group intros um, and they work perfectly fine. So um, it's also seeing how the chimps react and what makes them comfortable and, and trying to, you know, take your cues from them as well. Yeah. So backing up a little bit, like why do this at all? If like, say at CSNW, you know, we had this stable group. I'm going to put that in quotes, stable um, <laughs> group of seven chimps who arrived in 2008. Because that, that group is actually, I mean, they have some serious fights. They've had some digits bitten off over the years. and um, But overall there, I think they would be considered a stable group. Um, and, you know, we were really hoping we'd be able to expand their social circle with more chimps. Um, and I think that there were people who questioned that, you know, you know, why would you kind of go through the stress of the, for the humans and for the chimps and like, why do it at all? If you're kind of dealing in these situations, it's, like captivity is not ideal for chimps to begin with. So, so why go through this process at all? That's inherently stressful. Well, I mean, as I mentioned before, chimps are designed to live socially and they're designed really to navigate pretty complex social networks. And, and I think they enjoy it. Like I think they thrive in groups and they need friends and they need a wide variety of companions. Um, but every chimp in captivity for the most part, with few exceptions are living in groups. So at some point somebody had to introduce these chimps to each other. So the group of seven, you know, as far as I know, live largely alone before they met each other. And so someone had to, you know, take a deep breath and open doors between those chimps and introduce them to each other. So it's enriching for chimps to expand their social circle. Um, I personally love to see groups have, you know, males and females, a wide range of ages, um, not necessarily just peers who are your same age or your same gender. Um, it just gives them a lot more variety and a lot more complexity and, um, and it's enriching. But the flip side is it's, it is, it's super risky because you never know the outcome. Um, it's very, very scary for the humans and probably very scary for the chimps as well. Um, and so you're not guaranteed a good outcome. So it's kind of a balance of 
risk versus reward. But when you see chimps make friends, hug each other, um, you know that that's what they want for the most part. Most chimps want this, especially the chimps who came from research. Um, they, they were so eager at Save the Chimps to be together. They wanted to be together. And so, um, you know, they deserve it. We, we should give them what they want. Yeah. Yeah, I think we've been a little bit surprised here with this latest round of intros with um, Honey Bee, Willie Bee, and Maeve and the group that came, the group of six that came earlier this year, just at how, like, Honey Bee's just up for it. She's just, like, ready. <laughs> And, you know, obviously they went when we were, when we did attempt to intro them with the seven, that was a traumatic experience for her, um, for sure. Like, I don't think there's any doubt about that, but she's just like, I don't know. She's, she's really into the process and Willie B too. He's not, you know, he's a little bit more aloof, um, from what we've observed, but he really, I mean, mostly he wants to be with Cy, but he's, you know, willing to meet the other chimps too. So I think that's been really helpful for us to just see their eagerness and, and wanting to go forward with everything. Um, let's see. Looking at my list of questions here. Um, what would you say is the most challenging part of bringing two groups of chimps together? Just figuring out physically how you're going to do it. Um, so because every facility typically has a different design, there's no one standard set up, you know, from place to place. And so part of it's just figuring out the logistics of it. Um, the other challenges are making sure we humans are all on the same page about doing it in the first place. And then also, what are we going to do if things don't go as, as we hope or as we expect? Um, how are we going to intervene and um, you know, scarier situations like fights and just making sure we're all on the same page. Um, communicating during an introduction is really challenging uh, because they, you know, we're all in physical different, physically different locations. The sim chimps sometimes get loud. So um, making sure we're all ready for that. Um, and then just sort of the, the opening the door is pretty hard. <laughs> so because... <laughs> You don't, you can never, in my view, you really can't predict what's going to happen. So I know, I think there's been, you know, some effort to do studies on how personality impacts, how they react to intros, you know, looking at how they interact with each other through mesh, you know, when they can't really get to each other. Um, and I have many times seen very friendly behavior at the mesh and then everything changes when you open the door and I've seen very, you know, oh, I don't like you behavior at the mesh and then the door opens and they're like, oh, oh, I didn't mean it. Sorry. <laughs> Let's be friends. So, um, so just taking that step and um, is, is very, very challenging. So even though I've done this many, many times, I still feel that anxiety and fear, you know, when you open the door, that, that doesn't ever go away. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I would think that the human side of things is probably almost more challenging in some ways because, um, I mean, it's really difficult for caregivers to take that leap because you are putting the chimps that you care for every day and that you've kind of promised to keep healthy and happy, um, in a situation where they could get injured. Um, and I mean, intellectually, you know, that you're doing that every day anyway, because you know, they live with other chimps who could injure them. Um, there's obviously things in their environment that can happen. Like life is not perfect and pure and pristine. You know, there's right. a lot of things that can happen. <laughs> Um, but I think that element of like you making that decision puts the responsibility, uh, more squarely on, on the caregiver's shoulders. And I've been really impressed with our staff here, mm -hmm. um, cause they've participated in this process, um, really more, even more so than JB and I, because the way that we've done the intros is the person who's the lead caregiver for the day has been kind of when you're here helping you or when you're not here, we've been doing some intros on our own and the caregivers are just running that process. Um, 
And so, so far, so good with that. Yeah. Um, but I, I really hear you that getting on the same page is pretty important. Um, and just taking that leap. Yeah, it is. It's a big leap. So, and I mean, the, the team that you have there, I mean, is amazing. And I think it's, it's harder too, when you've seen it not go well, when you've seen, you know, pretty much almost the worst that can happen. Um, it makes it incredibly hard to start over again and, and continue forward and try again. It's important to keep going because there are still chimps in need um, and we're probably not gonna be able to get those chimps out of the situations they're in now um, without finishing, without doing these intros so that we can um, move chimps into sanctuary. Yeah. Um, let's see. I think maybe with that. <laughs> I love the slow raise. She just, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, we received actually quite a few really great questions from people who are really interested in this and who've been following the blog and they get our little like snippets of video that we post mm -hmm. of the intros and, um, so I thought I would start asking you their questions. Sure. Um, so let's see. Some of them I might be able to answer first. So this is from Mark Blitzer, who's been a supporter for quite a number of years. And he was saying that he couldn't remember at the first, first group from Wildlife Way Station, so Honey Bee, Willie Bee, Maeve, knew the second group. And was wondering if they did know each other, if that might explain the easier process of merging the two versus our, our unsuccessful attempt with, with the group of seven. So just to start with an answer to that question, we've had a few different um, former caregivers at Wildlife Way Station reach out to us recently and have learned that, um, and I've then confirmed this with Onher, who's still working with the chimps there and has been at Wildlife Way Station for a long time, that... Uh, the group of nine, <laughs> uh, hopefully we'll be able to say that soon. Um, they did all know each other and lived next to each other at various different points in their lives at Wildlife Way Station. So they had a level of familiarity for sure. And in fact, she like shared mesh with one another. Um, so do you think that makes it easier if, if they had that past history? I do think it makes it easier. So, I mean, we know captive monkeys, for example, who are singly housed in research laboratories, even though they don't physically interact with each other, they form a social group with the monkeys who are in the room, so, so or social relationships um, in any respect. So that's how much these guys want to have that kind of connection with members of you know, their own species. So they've had opportunities to establish some sort of relationship, some sort of familiarity, even if they didn't physically live with each other. Just seeing each other and hearing each other, I think, does make a big difference. And that's also, I think, you know, a little less of a scary prospect, too, to go into a room with someone who you have a little bit of knowledge of rather versus someone who you have never, ever seen or spoken to before in your life. Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so a similar question from Caroline Hero. She is wondering if maybe part of the reason our first attempts at, at merging um, Honey Bee, Willie Bee, Maeve with the original seven was unsuccessful because they had been on their own for so long. And and had been, you know, at our sanctuary for quite a number of years. And so maybe we're just a lot more territorial. Maybe. I mean, it's, it's hard to say. There were a lot of good intros with that group. I mean, I wasn't there for, for any of them, but I just, I know that just from talking to you guys that there were a lot of really positive interactions and there was just this particular incident that um, certain things happen and, you just have to make the call like, okay, we can't repeat this combination again because it was such a extreme outcome. Um, so, um, you know, I do think there was potential there and it's unfortunate it didn't end up um, working out, but I, you know, it, it didn't make sense to go forward after, um, after the injuries that happened to Burrito. And so, um, 
we have another opportunity with these three chimps meeting another group of six chimps and hopefully this time around it'll go a little bit better yeah yeah and there's obviously a lot of um history with chimps who like the pet chimps who've been like alone in garages for decades and then end up merging with a group who's maybe been at a sanctuary for quite a while so I think that ter territoriality issue is definitely something that exists um with chimps they are very territorial but I think with it's not a deal breaker for <laughs> for no. not being able to integrate them. No, I definitely don't think it's a deal breaker. And, um, and I think too, it wasn't necessarily the seven who were not accepting of Billy B's group. It was just a, that particular dynamic mm -hmm. at that moment wasn't successful. So, but I think that I mean, at least, I mean, seeing the hugs that Maeve gave everybody, I mean, yeah. some of the amazing intros that you had, I think Burritos Group welcomed um, that. So it is very, obviously, you know, unusual and exciting for them. They hadn't seen other chimps in a long time, and I'm sure it was very unexpected <laughs> to have suddenly some new chimps next door. Um, but but I still think it's, it's possible in, in zoos and sanctuaries do it all the time, integrate chimps into existing social groups um, successfully. So it's possible. It just is a never a hundred percent guaranteed. Yeah. And she was kind of wondering if maybe we have plans for having one big social group. And at this point we don't. And, you know, some of that is, I mean, it's definitely just what happened. And I feel like even the personalities of the individuals have changed and, you know, mm. it would potentially be possible for us to try again like I don't I don't think that would be out of the realm of possibility but I think from the human perspective we just don't want to put burrito in that position again right. um, it, but you know the group is going to change over time unfortunately we're you know that group of seven they're almost all in their 40s now and some in their upper 40s yeah. and so the dynamics are going to change as we lose individuals so I think we're just going to try to keep keep an open mind about things and uh, we'll just see what the future has for them. But for now, we're just planning on keeping them as their own social group. Yeah. And I think that makes sense. And I think that's the important thing is not saying like the door is shut on all possibilities ever in the future um, and keeping an open mind about it. Um, because like you said, you know, if you're down to just a few chimps, then it's might be in their best interest to have, have some new friends again so it's right. a hard thing to think about you know like this is all very <laughs> painful and emotional and there's a lot of um a lot of emotion tied up in all of it so um, for sure yeah um so let's see chris moore had a question about doing the um kind of pre-introductions at the mesh first what types of behavior are you looking for to determine whether or not to go ahead with the actual introduction with opening that door um, what point would you determine that face-to-face -face introduction wouldn't be a good idea and how much time at the mesh do you typically give? So my own preference is not a huge amount of time at the mesh. Um, I'm not someone who puts the mesh, chimps mesh to mesh for days and days on end, um, waiting for some sort of outcome. Um, so I usually do pretty brief times at the mesh, but brief can be five minutes, it can also mean an hour. So, um, so much depends on how the chimps are reacting. But some of the things I look for um, are, you know, panting, kissing, grooming, just, you know, basically friendly greeting behaviors. Um, or, and so if the chimps are doing that sort of thing, you have a little bit more confidence that it's going to be okay um, when the door opens. Um, we also, you know, look for any negative behaviors or what we would perceive as negative, like, you know, trying to bite or scream or smack the mesh. Um, but sometimes they just, they do that and they just got to get it out of their system and then they, they calm down. Um, but I want to have some sort of interaction. So if the chimps are just not interacting, ignoring each other, um, we want to see something, some sort of um, communication between them, or at least communication that's obvious to us. 
um, before we open the door. Um, I also wait for whatever that interaction is for the intensity to drop a little bit. So sometimes they like groom, groom, groom at the mesh and like really intense tooth clacking and, you know, breathy panting. And it's, you can just tell there's an intensity. Sometimes I like to wait for them to actually take a break from grooming and maybe part just a little bit um, before we proceed with opening the door. And then obviously if they're arguing, um, we wait for them to to calm down and maybe have some some friendly behaviors or some apologies or some some panting. I look for eye contact. That's another thing I look for. Um, and then and then we open the door. But we're also careful when we open the door. One thing we um, have the ability to do at Chimp Sanctuary Northwest, which I really like, is just nudging the door open a little bit. So the chimps are very fully aware that the door is about to open, um, and we can see does this change their behavior dramatically um, when they know the door is going to open? And um, if when we nudge that door open, we see lots of <laughs> panting and, you know, kind of happiness, then, then we just go ahead and open the door. But if they relaunch into, you know, screaming or fighting at each other, um, then we just wait a little while longer. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, our system, I, there was a question, let me see if I can find it, about how our setup is. Maybe I made it all up. But what I was going to say is um, there's a huge signal with our system. So it's uh, you turn on a pump and it makes mm -hmm. this very loud noise. And there's like no secret that we're going to be able to operate doors at that point. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> And it also, so what we've had, the setup that we've had is we'll have somebody at that switch. So there's one caregiver who turns on the switch um, and then another person who's operating the doors themselves. And then that person at the switch stays there, turns it off when things seem to be going okay, but is at the ready to turn it back on. Yeah. Um, so, which is a little bit of a challenge. I mean, it'd be nice if it wasn't necessarily that way, but on the other hand, it's, it is like a, the chimps are not surprised about what's happening. Yeah. It's an advantage when you're starting the introduction. Um, the other thing I liked about it is if there were two chimps on either side of the mesh, you weren't really interacting much. If you flip that switch on, it kind of stirs up some activity. So we're not actually opening the door yet. Um, but they were like, oh, something's happening. And sometimes that gets them to actually interact with each other. Um, when the switch has been a disadvantage is what you want to end their, um, the introduction and have them go their separate ways. And there's no way <laughs> to, to like say, oh, they're apart. Let's close the door. They hear that switch. And if they want to be together, then they rush back together. So that's when it's a disadvantage. But um, mostly I kind of like having that signal. So it was it was a useful tool. Okay. That's good to know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At um, Save the Chimps, all of our doors were manual. So we would have to like kind of make a big deal of unlocking the lock and jiggle um, the door handle. We would do those sorts of things. Um to, to announce to the chimps that we were opening doors. Right. But then they were probably a little bit quicker too when you wanted to close them. Yes. Yeah. We were able to close them quickly. Although if a chimp didn't want the door closed and held it open, there was really nothing we could do about it. Right. There's a, that's a kind of the thing with chimps is you hope for the best. And a lot of times there's not a lot that you can do exactly. <laughs> if things don't go the way you want. And that is kind of a lot of the questions that people asked is like, well, what do you do if something goes wrong? If there's some um, fight that breaks out, what, what, what do you do? How do you try to end that? So um, sort of some tiered responses. So the first goal when a fight breaks out um, is if they're not actually injuring each other yet, sometimes you just wait and see is it going to escalate? Because a lot of disputes are brief in nature. They resolve it on their own and it's not really necessary for us to intervene. So we want to give them that chance. Uh, but if it's proceeding to the point of injury, or even if it's like they're just chasing, chasing, chasing with really no resolution for, you know, a relatively long period of time, then we, um, we want to just kind of put a stop to that so they can take a deep breath and, um, and move past those feelings that they're having. 
Um, but if they are injuring each other, um, if we can just close the door between them, like if, you know, they split apart and go into different rooms and we can't close the door, that's the best option. Um, but when it's necessary, we use the hose. Um, and Um, I hate using the hose. Um, I don't, many chimps, unfortunately, in research labs have had the hose used on them for reasons for shifting, like getting them to move certain places. And I don't, I don't use it for that purpose. And I would never want to use it for that purpose um, anymore. I unfortunately did when I was in the lab, was taught to do that. Um, but um, when you don't have very many tools at hand to stop chimps from injuring each other um, you do have to use the hose so um, and some chimps a quick spritz is enough like it just startles them out of you know what they're doing other chimps you have to spray them right in their face um, so that they disengage from what they're doing um, and then I'll also use it as sort of a quasi barrier um, if the chimps split apart but aren't in different rooms yet um, direct the stream in between them it, can sometimes deter them from, from going at each other again um, until they go into different rooms. So those are the, the method, the hose is the primary method that, that I've used. Um, loud noise, if you can't get to chimps with a hose, if they're in a location where you can't get to them with a hose um, because they're too far away or in a large space, then loud noises that sound like a gunshot um, can sometimes deter them. Um, air horns, I've used those in the past as well. Um, and then I know we were prepared to use um, fire extinguishers if it got really, really bad. Um, I've never used that myself, but it makes, you know, loud discharge, smoky, as long as you're not actually directing the fire extinguisher chemicals at the chimps themselves, um, it may be a possible deterrent. You're basically trying to get them to snap out of that behavior of injuring each other and get them focused on moving away from each other. Um, yeah. And what, what if there is an injury? What, what then? So first is get the chimps apart and assess how severe the injury is. Um, in most cases, you know, the injuries are, um, you know, just might require some medication or pain medications or antibiotics. Um, but otherwise don't need other intervention. But if they're more severe, then you would have to have a veterinarian anesthetize the chimp and, and treat the wounds. So it depends on the severity. Um, if there is wounding, in most cases, that's sort of it. But it is, it's a good idea, if you can, to give the chimp some sort of opportunity to reconcile. So if you can avoid ending their introduction on a negative note, um, it's, it's good too. So you may not necessarily put them back together again, but at least giving them some, a chance at the mesh to, to talk to each other, um, maybe make up. Um, if the wounding is really minor, just like scrapes or, um, you know, even just sort of minor bites, you may put them back together and see, um, will they make up? Because very often they do. Um, very often they apologize to each other and then you have a much better foundation for the next the next time they need each other. Right. Yeah. I kind of feel like, you know, chimps having conflicts with one another and then resolving them. That, that's ideal. <laughs> yeah. If that happens. Cause then they're learning that how each of them works and they're, cause there are going to be conflicts, um, mm -hmm. you know, they're primates just like us. Yep. So it's going to exactly. happen. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, let's see. 
Rosemary Stephenson is wondering when an introduction is not successful, is it more likely to be males or females that are resistant or aggressive, or is there no difference between the genders? Well, this is another area where I wish I had kept data, um, but I don't, so it's all subjective. Um, I feel like males, when they don't get along, are more likely to inflict more severe injuries on each other, but I feel like two females in general often seem like it's more likely they're the ones who aren't going to get along. So, um, so males, I mean, chimps in the wild who are born into, you know, a, a typical society without, you know, humans messing with them live in male bonded societies. So the males want to stay together. Um, the catches in the wild, they're born into the group. So it's a natal group. They grow up knowing each other. Um, we are often putting chimps who are strangers to each other um, together, and that wouldn't happen in most cases in the wild. And if it, if it did, it often has a, a lethal outcome. Um, but because a lot of these chimps have just sort of have really deprived social upbringings, I find that most of them they just they want to be together. So males want to they want their bromances. <laughs> they really do. So when they get along, like it's super great. Females are a little bit more, I think suspicious of each other, you know, um, not always a hundred percent like super friendly, um, unless you're Maeve, who's like awesome with everybody. Um, so it seems like sometimes those actually were a little bit more rocky, but they didn't tend to have as dramatic injuries, um, with each other, more just sort of screaming, slapping type fights. Right. Yeah. That's interesting. Even if it's just anecdotal. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> very, um, very subjective. <laughs> so there are a couple people who are wondering just specifically how we're determining the order of who gets introduced first and then from there who's second and that process. So we did look at, you know, who had prior histories with each other, um, with these nine chimps, um, who the past introductions that um, Willie and Honey and Maeve had, like who was good in intros and who wasn't. So we sort of had some pairs that were like, we'd like to start with these chimps who we think are going to go really well. But in the end, it's which chimp wants to separate, like which chimps wants to, which chimp wants to try. So um, you could have in your mind who you wanted, um, but if that chimp was not interested, well, then you just go with who wants to participate that day. So um, it's a little bit partly what we want and also partly what the chimps decide they're going to do. Right. Yeah. And just to explain a little bit more the way that our setup works is we are doing the intros in what we're calling the front rooms of, of the extent expansion. And then um, the groups are in the playrooms and the greenhouses on different sides. So in order to get, Ch and there's the mezzanine too so in order to get chimps separated we have to like separate them into an area before we get them into the front rooms to do the intros so it really is complicated um mm -hmm. and with the more chimps you know with the group of six it's a little more complicated so there have been a couple of chimps who have been like not raising their hand to be intro yeah. as much as others um and that actually leads me to one of my questions is you know, based on the conversations that you had with us about how Honeybee, Willoughby, and Maeve were before and, you know, what you know about them too, were there any surprises that um, have happened in this whole process? Well, Honey being so amazing has been a big and very pleasant surprise. So um, just based on the behavior of the chimps that you'd seen in the past and even the behavior of their size group, like I was like, oh, I was like Honey and then Gordo and the other group are going to be the two most challenging chimps. And Honey's been a rock star. Like she's been really, really awesome. I mean, we've had, there was one meeting, you know, with Terry that didn't go so great. Um, but otherwise, like super playful, fun, like she's been really awesome, very engaging. Um, and then Maeve surprised me in the group scenarios. So Maeve is wonderful with like everybody one-on-one -on -one, like across the board super warm and friendly and but when we started doing the small groups together she was uh, much more reserved much more hesitant and 
And that surprised me that that change and dynamic impacted her so much. So um, both of them surprised me quite a bit. That's why it's fun, right? You just yeah. never know. <laughs> yeah, you never know. So, And when you just have these great intros, like, I mean, for me, like, Honey and Rain together, these oh two my sisters, like, who are so similar, and just the play, and rough and tumble, like, they just have the best time. Like, it's, yeah. it's yeah. so great to see that. It really is. Yeah. That's yeah. definitely the heartwarming part of yeah. it all. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Just two more questions, I think. So Lori Moat asks about the hierarchy of chimps in captivity. Um, once a group has been established and you have a dominant alpha chimp, what are the chances another chimp will try to take over that position? And how does it differ from life in the wild when they might join another group on their own? So part of that is what you were explaining, um, with the way wild chimp societies work the males stay in their natal groups but the females do move to other groups when they mature Mm -hmm. um so that's a big difference obviously between captivity in the wild where in captivity you're keeping them in in the same groups although i guess most chimps in captivity end up doing intros at some point in their lives right yeah yeah they do (laughs) they do so um i mean i've seen some changes in you know the who's dominant over time, but, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about dominance and the importance of, of dominance in both wild and captive groups. And I feel like the captive groups, it's a lot less clear sometimes. Like there've been times where I'm like, I'm not hundred percent sure who the most dominant individual is in this group. Sometimes the most dominant individual is a female as we see with Jamie and, um, And so there's a lot more I think, sort of behavioral flexibility in captive groups um, that may or may not exist in wild groups. Um, you know, we as humans do have sort of this notion of the alpha male and um, that biologically, I think we're learning more and more is not really necessarily how things work. Um, but in um, but I've seen some takeovers um, that don't necessarily, you know, take place in violence sometimes. The alpha male is just like, I'm cool with not having this responsibility anymore. Like, you can have it. Um, that's fine. And um, and the females, um, you know, they just, they work things out on their own. And I also see, to me, subjectively captive chimps, um, females act more like bonobo chimps in the wild do, like forming really close female friendships that are not necessarily seen in wild chimps. Um so, and also be having quite a bit of power um, in their social groups. So it's very, it's, it's always dynamic. So, I mean, that's one thing that's so interesting about chimps is they're very dynamic and fluid and often unpredictable. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. And I think the whole notion, like you're saying with the sort of pecking order where you have the alpha chimp and then, you know, he has his like second in command. I think the thought process of that is changing quite a lot just yeah. as we observe more and there's more stuff about like social networking and what, how that works and that it's all context dependent too. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's not, I don't think it's as clear cut as, as maybe it was portrayed, you know, 40, 50 years ago. Sure. Yeah, I agree. It's more of a matrix, you know, it's, mm-hmm. you can have chimp A be dominant over chimp B and, chimp C, but then chimp C has a different dominance relationship and with various individuals. So um, it's very fluid. Um, And as you say, like really context dependent, you know, whether food is involved or potential Mm -hmm. mates are involved or or what have you. Ah, So you brought up food, which actually there was a question about that. Um, If we have been serving meals during the intro process and if that might be an important step to take to make sure that you know folks are getting along when food is present so typically it's more about the time of day that we're doing the intros so you know the routine um, in a sanctuary is is typically you're taking care of all the cleaning and um, making enrichment and all of the the day-to-day tasks that have to be done in the morning um, and leaving the the mid to late afternoon for intros. So meals aren't necessarily served at that time. So um, we typically 
didn't serve a lot of meals. Um, but it is always interesting to see how they cope with that. Um, it does bring in an element of work of competition that might arise um, that wasn't otherwise there. So I don't always do it on the first time around, um, but subsequent introductions, um, yeah, it's okay to, to introduce food into the picture. Yeah, and we now, I don't know if we've talked about this much on the blog, but we have been stationing Willie B because he tends to steal food. And he does really well with that during meals because he knows if he stays in his spot. And he can kind of wander around as long as he's not just like going over to take food from Maeve or Honeybee. Um, but we've been doing the same with Gordo because Gordo will steal food from anybody. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Gordo, like, I think like two seconds into stationing training, he just knew. So maybe he had had that before um, and he just gets it. And so he's he's great at stationing. So we would probably continue that. Uh, when we do start introducing meals with the, the intros, at least with those two. So they kind of know what's going on, even in a different social group. Um, yeah. And it, I think more than anything, it eases things with the other chimps uh, in their social group. They kind of understand that things are going to hopefully be a little bit calmer because they're the person who steals food is in their, in their spot. <laughs> yeah. They don't have to watch their, their back so much and watch their right. food. So, right. Yeah. So I think I'm going to end with this question from Carrie Miller, another supporter who's been quite around for quite a long time. Um, will attempts to merge various groups be an ongoing process over the years as even more chimps may be welcome to the sanctuary. I wanted to tackle that, um, we are actually in the process right now of trying to figure out big picture what we're doing. Um, but initially, with this expansion, this was going to be it for, for us taking in chimps. Um, we have kind of the building set up so that, you know, this is a good number of chimps for us to have. Um, and hopefully, if if the introductions work, that they'll just have a lot of variety of spaces. and um, But not really not really in our opinion room to to bring in a whole another group um so if we do rescue more chimps we would have to bring build on another part of the property so we're just trying to figure out what's needed and what our next steps would be and if we don't um rescue more chimps in the future we're going to be looking at other smaller primate species to help so that's where we're at as an organization. Um, and we're just having these like very intense conversations about it to try to figure out what's best. And I think part of it is we were hopeful that at this point there wouldn't be as many chimps that were in need as there are. And the wildlife way station closing just, you know, that was a lot of chimps coming into the sanctuary community that weren't necessarily planned for. Um, so I guess part of her question is, like the timing of intros and the speed and our hopes for, for merging groups too. So I, do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, the time really varies. Um, I have called it chimp time in the past. So um, there's, it's hard to have a timetable of like when a particular social group is, is going to be able to live together, you know, without separating you know, chimps in and out. Um, and redoing intros over and over again. So um, some of the larger groups that saved the chimps, some of them took, you know, a year um, to get together. So um, I'm hopeful, at least with this group of nine, that, you know, sometime early next year, we will be successful in having all nine of them together. Um, but then there's also the time period after that. So you put those chimps together and then there's a, there is a, there's a period of unrest, so they still have a lot to work out, and um, and often they're not really fully settled for for even you know a year maybe um, where they've kind of chilled out and calmed down and maybe aren't having so many conflicts. So, um, but I'm cautiously optimistic. I mean, just based on the intros we've had so far, that that we are going to be able to get all of them um, together, um, but. I've been wrong before. I could be wrong again. <laughs> so there's never any promises. Just um, right now, there's not anything that I've seen that leads me to believe that it's it's not going to work out. So, Yeah, that's great. 
yeah, did you want to add anything else? Well, I just, I mean, for me, I just want to say like how amazing the, the team is at Chimp Sanctuary Northwest. Like, I mean, I was there and um, they dove right in doing these intros. Um, it's not something that most of the, the team had a ton of experience with and so eager to um, to learn and take those chances, even though I know they were um, anxious and afraid. And I was too, like, um, I don't want to come in and see any of these guys yeah, get hurt. Um, but they really like embraced it. And, um, and when I'm not there, you're continuing to put them together. So, which is really important um, to keep them familiar with each other and keep them establishing those relationships. So um, everyone there is just really a, a joy to work with. And I'm so impressed. And then also, your supporters, like I've loved their engagement with this whole process um, through the blog and and um, and appreciate their enthusiasm and support for the process because I know they love these chimps as much as as any of us. And it's it is a scary prospect. So um, I just think you guys do incredible work. Thank you. Thanks so much for being there for us. I don't think we could have really get, gotten it started um, without your help and your continued support. And, you know, whenever we have an intro and you're not present, I'm sending you the kind of notes from the caregivers. So you're keeping up on everything and talking to, to Dr. Aaron, too. Um, so we are really grateful that you exist in the world and have so much experience and have been helpful. And I know you care so much about all the chimps here too. Yeah, I really do. And it's, I mean, it's, it's a gift for me to be able to come out there and, and participate in it and stay connected to chimps. Like they're, they are my favorite people in the world. So um, it's, it's an honor to be a small part of their lives. So thank you. All right, here we are again. Hello. <laughs> Hello. How are you? Pretty good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Good. I'm excited to hear how the chimps are doing. Yeah, it's been really exciting. Um, yeah, so I should have looked before I got on this call. I don't remember when our first recorded conversation was, but it was sometime in the fall. And sounds about right. Yeah, when we had kind of had gotten a little far into the like one-on-one, -on -one, two on two um, integration attempts. So that was like the beginning of our process. And I just thought it would be helpful for our supporters and others too, who work with chimps, just kind of get a feel for how we were doing things. And um, we gave the opportunity for our blog readers to submit questions. Cool. So there were some really good questions and we, I put together a video of that conversation. So I thought it'd be nice now that the group is fully integrated to yes. follow yeah. up <laughs> and um, again, ask our blog readers if they had any particular questions that they wanted answered. Um, and yeah, just to discuss how things went when you, the last visit you had out here when we actually put everyone together. Um, yeah. So I think, Maybe what I'll do is to get started is just talk about your your last visit. So, um, and how, um, you know, like before, if, uh, and I'm going to tack this video onto the old one so everyone okay. can watch the whole thing. So, we discussed before just sort of the process of, of bringing the chimps together in the front rooms and getting them to know each other one-on-one -on -one and then two-on-two -two and occasionally although not super often, uh, larger groups together. Um, so what was different about the last time you visited, how you had decided to set things up, and what made you kind of move forward with the bigger group formations or the suggestion of the bigger group formations? Because um, the staff were operating the doors and kind of with you the whole time. Right. So, I mean, a lot of it had to do with the fact that you guys throughout the winter kept – putting the chimps together. So they would basically have play dates and continue the introductions. 
and had kind of somewhat larger groups, I think even, you know, some groups of six, right? Some three on threes. And there was no like major setbacks. The chimps were doing pretty well together. Maybe a minor scuffle here and there, or maybe some days where they didn't necessarily feel like being together, but overall it went really well. And so a lot of it was winter was over, yay. And I could come back to Washington without being um, stuck due to closing the pass <laughs> due to snow. So um, I think that they were ready. So the next steps for them were, um, they were kind of multifold. So one, getting them in more space. So letting them have the playrooms, which we had done once when I was still there. Um, letting them have access to the greenhouses, spending the night together, and then also growing the group in size until all nine were together. So um, we started out with, you know, a three on three and they spent the night together and they did well and there was really no reason to not to keep going. Um, and we did. And everyone was amazing. Like they powered through and we actually got all nine together faster than I expected because the chimps did great. Like they seemed to be excited to be together. There weren't any major conflicts. They spent the night, maybe not super peacefully. They did wake up the staff in the middle of the night with some rowdiness. <laughs> But nothing, nothing terrible, um, just sort of displaying and noisy and, um, you know, recognizing things are different. So, and then, I mean, really in a matter of days, we had all nine together and it was great. Yeah. So boom, done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it would be nice if that was it, right? <laughs> like, yes. <laughs> Everything's exactly. great now. And I know exactly. sometimes that does happen with groups. It's just like all right it's like you know no worries from here on out right <laughs> well i don't think you ever have no worries from here on out so um i remember the last day that i was there you know we met and i was like all right kind of the my part was the easy part getting everybody together and i'm the one who flies away home and you guys still have to manage the day-to-day -day and wonder how they're gonna to continue to get together. I know the biggest concern is spent at night um, in the early mornings, because that's when they're the rowdiest, early in the morning. And, you know, you just never know. There's no way to really know, like, is this gonna remain stable? Is it gonna constantly get better? Or is it gonna get worse? And that's true for captive groups and it's true for groups who are free living also. There's always changes in power and sometimes traumatic things happen even in those groups. So um, unfortunately that comes to the territory of caring for and, and loving these guys. So, but it's worth it. Yeah. Yeah. And it was interesting because we were so, you know, obviously worried about the new group and watching over them. And anytime anyone would scream, you know, we'd run over at least to the cameras to see what was going on. If not to, you know, the, where they were and kind of at the ready waiting to shut doors between chimps if if things got out of hand which you know we haven't had to do at all which has been pretty That's amazing yeah it's really good so there have definitely been fights um there were a couple that resulted in injuries but that like you're saying it's part of chimps um yeah and we haven't felt like there were red flags with the conflicts like there we haven't seen knock on wood <laughs> we haven't seen like six on three which is something that we would be really concerned about that um they would kind of revert to their groups and just really clash and um we haven't seen like any one particular individual that's been targeted that was another thing that we were you know really watching for but so during this process of us being so concerned about the new group Burrito just goes and bites Negra, <laughs> and she has to have stitches. Oh, that was Burrito? Um, I didn't know that. Yeah, I know. I know some people don't necessarily want to know, but uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah. he's like the most happy-go-lucky guy until he's right. not. And, um, you know, Negra forgave him. Um, so we should all oh, forgive that's him good. too. <laughs> yep. Oh, I do. Burrito <laughs> can almost do no wrong. So, <laughs> in my mind. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, and you know, maybe some of the tension from the group, you know, obviously they're they're all in, not in, you know, they're in the old group is in the old building and the new group is in the extension, but they hear each other and there's just one door separating their player into the front room area. So, you know, some of the like fighting could be causing tension in the older group. Um, or, you know, every few years in the burritos group, somebody gets injured, you know, not necessarily always burritos fall, although often it is. <laughs> and uh, that's just chimps. So they've been together for 15 years here. And before, prior to that, they were together. And we still have fights where we have to stitch folks up every once in a while. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it was kind of interesting that we were so worried about the other group, and then <laughs> we <laughs> it was have the a, seven. Yeah, <laughs> but I think you're right. I mean, the point you make about them seeing and hearing each other. I mean, chimps are so aware of everything that's going on around them, and they can see a little bit what's going on. They can hear them. They can feel caregiver tension too. So all of that can. All that can contribute, um, but also it could have absolutely nothing to do with the other group, and we shall never know. So. Yeah, yeah, I think that's been, not that I really needed this lesson, but it's just sort of been repeated over and over through this process is, like, we, we kind of create these narratives about what's going on and, you know, why a certain chimp is doing something or how the interaction is, but we only have a limited amount of information that we're going from. Right. And we don't know as much as we think we know, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah I think I... It, it helps to be really humble. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, even with the, you know, we have the camera system, which has been great. And um, there was a, a conflict a few weeks ago now. And um, it was when Caitlin was staying overnight and, um, it was in the early morning, and so JB and I had gone up there, and we were at the kind of tail end of the conflict, and everyone was everything was dying down, and we're like, wow, you know, Willie B and Dora seemed to completely stay out of that. And then we were able to rewind <laughs> the footage and discovered that, like, Willie B was in the center of it, and Dora attacked him at one point. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. <Dora. laughs> So like, and these things happen so, so quickly that mm -hmm. it's actually impossible um, to, to see everything that's going on during a conflict yeah. in real time. And remember it. Yeah. So, and yeah. remember what happened. So. Yeah. And even with the cameras, um, there was another point where I thought that I had, I was watching Willie B and Gordo groom. This was kind of on and I was like, oh, this is amazing. This is a big turning point. And then one of them walks away and I realized, oh, that was Terry and Gordo. Oh. <laughs> You're like, oh, much less of a big yeah. deal. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So obviously a lot, a lot of the questions that people had were about conflicts. Um, uh, and, you know, what we do to kind of... Well, here's a good question from Mona. She says, if fighting continues after integration is deemed successful, that's kind of a question in itself. Like, when do we say this is a success? I don't know what you did in your previous experience, like when you were like, I feel like we did it. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, there's no hard and fast line. So I think I would probably let myself relax a little bit after about a month or so of chimps being together with nothing super major happening, no decline in the quality of their relationships. If they did have conflict, if they reconciled afterwards, that was actually really great and positive. If they didn't reconcile, then I would start to worry a little bit. But um, I mean, 30 days is an arbitrary human measurement that probably means nothing to chimps. So, um, so but that's sort of when I would start to relax a little bit. Yeah. And I have heard people, well, you and other people say a group isn't like completely settled for like six months, even a, up to a year. So what does that mean to you to be settled? I think probably, I mean, definitely 
fights are infrequent. Again, infrequent is subjective, but there are usually, you know, more conflicts in the beginning of a group formation. And then if they kind of die down over time, it's they establish relationships and establish their own social norms. Um, they usually die down. So that's part of it. Um, and then maybe less segregation based on their former groupings, you know, more intermixing, um, you know, some groups still, even after a long time, like larger groups that we would briefly split up just for meal times, just because it made it a little bit simpler to serve a group of six rather than a group of 24. Um, I think by habit, they would go into their former groups, but um, you would see more mixing and less of that segregation over time. I think it was helpful too with these, this group that many of them had prior history together. So it wasn't nece it isn't necessarily a group of six tightly bonded chimps versus a group of three tightly bonded chimps who had never had social history with each other. And so I think that's really been helpful that they knew each other. A lot of them knew each other beforehand and lived in groups. It wasn't like a fleeting meeting. They actually lived together for a period of time. Right. Yeah. So we, I mean, with Maeve, she's just so social and mm -hmm. just like, she wants to be with everybody and she wants to be in everyone's business and <laughs> uh, um and willie b and honeybee are not the same way they're much more reclusive i guess and so what what we've been seeing is they but even with them they're i mean they're doing great really great and willie b is obviously very interested in being around the other chimps honeybee i think is taking a little bit longer so I think I wrote or somebody wrote about this on the blog that when we shift, Honeybee likes to stay back and just be alone for the morning when we're shifting around. Yeah. And um, I was working just this past Saturday and um, as the shifter and she actually did shift with the group um, and seemed okay with that too. But then later in the afternoon, she wanted her alone time. So I don't think it's as much about you know, not wanting to be around people. It's just like, she's just a little more reclusive and, and, and needs that time to herself, which I totally yeah. understand. <laughs> I get it too. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Well, Both her and Maeve, like their how they reacted during the intros versus one-on-one -on -one and group has really been just interesting because yeah. Maeve was the hugger, right? Mm -hmm. And so we were like, oh, she'll get along with everybody. Mm -hmm. We were a little bit more concerned about Honey, and then when we started the intros, Honey was amazing. Maeve was great too, but Honey was amazing. Mm -hmm. And then when we started doing the larger groups, Maeve was a lot more standoffish, yep. and Honey was pretty engaged, but then now that everybody's together, they've reverted to Honey being more standoffish and Maeve being the social butterfly. So it's, so, it's just always so interesting to me how fluid chimps are and you know, how we think we know them and we think we can predict how they're going to behave. And then they just surprise us every single yeah. day. Yeah. Yeah. So we now are seeing them really only segregate into their groups at night to, for okay. sleeping. Um, and Maeve has started to branch off once in a while. So she's, okay. she's been sleeping with the bigger group. Um, oh, interesting. Every once in a while she go into mm -hmm. the playroom, but otherwise, um, it's Maeve, Honeybee, Willie Bee sleeping in the front rooms. So I'm going to be really interested to see if that changes. Because um, we still are seeing a bit of rowdiness at night. Mm -hmm. um, like early morning, or really early morning, sometimes three, two, three in the morning, or four or five in the morning, or both of those times, Willie Bee will start displaying. And I kind of wonder if it could be like he wants to be with the bigger group and he he's kind of just socially awkward like he doesn't necessarily yeah. know how to make that uh bridge which I completely relate to like I hate going to parties because I don't know <laughs> <laughs> like how to approach people that I don't know and so when I'm watching him I'm like I get it man I, I <laughs> he needs a dog to hang out with like yeah. that's how I am at parties I'm like oh there's a dog I'll just go spend time with the dog yeah, exactly. <laughs> so he does these funny things um like he'll some of the chimps in the like a little bit later in the morning when it starts warming up they'll be in the greenhouses and he'll be in the playroom so the window separating them and he'll just be like 
kind of knocking, displaying at the window, just like letting everyone Pay know. Pay attention to me. Yeah. <laughs> and then eventually he gets up the courage and goes through. And oh. I think so much of it has been everyone just adjusting to his behavior, like understanding that he's not a threat, you know, mm -hmm. it's just Willie it's being just socially Willie. awkward. Yeah. And yeah. so they kind of understand it a little bit better. Um, but it will be interesting to see if, if they continue to kind of segregate for yeah. sleeping or if that changes. Yeah. What would be your guess? <laughs> um, I mean, they have so much space and so much choice as to where to sleep. I do think it'll be a while before they start all sleeping more cohesively. Yeah. I think if you brought in another group of chimps, that would probably be something that would change the equation. Right. Because then it's going to be a little bit more us nine against. Right. These, these folks over here who you want us to live with. Right. Yeah. Um, so I kind of derailed the rest of Mo's question. So, um, so we were talking about like, how do you decide if a group is successful? But the other part of her question was how do you, once, uh, you know, fighting continues, even after you've said, well, this seems like things are working out. Okay. How do you work to ensure that, things are more or less peaceful. And she was thinking about, um, you know, when we did attempt the integrations with Burrito's group and he was injured, um, you know, we separated everyone and called it quits. And yeah. she knows, you know, from our blog that we've had some injuries with the new integrated group, but we, we didn't separate anyone. In fact, we didn't even, like I was saying, we haven't even closed doors between them. So they haven't been separated yeah at all except for honeybee during cleaning right. that's the only time um so yeah how do you ensure a peaceful coexistence how do you decide when to separate chimps if they're newly integrated well i don't think we can ever 100 percent ensure a peaceful coexistence but there are things that we can do to try to avoid setting up conflict so um i'm always trying to be mindful of what i call the balance of power so um Honey being alone by yourself during, you know, cleaning, that's fine. But if it were a situation where Honey and everybody else and she didn't have Willie B or Maeve accessible to her, that might be a situation where she could get into a little bit of trouble. Maybe not. I mean, size group is a wonderful group, but um, but just trying to make sure people always have a buddy nearby, um, someone they can count on um, if, if, you know, things don't go their way. Um, not setting up competitive scenarios in other ways, like at meal times or when passing out enrichment. And um, when I was there, you always had more than one person serving meals. Um, the chimps had plenty of places to, to spread out to receive their meals and receive their enrichment. So, um, so that's really helpful too. Um, and then um, what was the other part of the question again? Oh, how do you decide like when it's not going to work? So um, for me, it's about, there's two things, severity of injury. So burritos injuries were extremely, extremely severe. They were life-threatening. You would never put a chimp back in that situation. Once that's happened, you would never ask them to try to reconcile with chimps who really were probably trying to kill you. I mean, that's the bottom line. That's what was happening. Um, so obviously severity of wounding. And then I also look at frequency of wounding. So if there's one chimp who's just getting injured over and over and over again, even if it's not necessarily severe, um, or there maybe is a slight increase in the severity of wounding over time, that might be a red flag. You maybe aren't 100% necessarily going to pull them out of the group, but you might start discussing some intervention strategies or deciding is this the best fit for that chimpanzee. You have to think about the welfare of the individual, the well-being, their stress level, are they living constantly in fear and watching their back all the time? Like you don't want to put a chimp through that either. Um, so it's about balancing that need versus their need to be with other people. Um, and every time it's a case by case basis and it involves the input of a lot of, you know, all the people who love and care for them and see different things. And, um, but ultimately we end up making that decision for them for sure. But, um, but I'm pretty tolerant. Um, as long as we're seeing reconciliation, as long as it doesn't seem like the chimp is, 
you know, like I said, looking over their shoulder all the time, um, we'll, you know, kind of let things go and see if they can work it out on their own. Um, and then possibly intervene if, it, if we seem, if we feel like the chimp is not doing well for many different reasons. Right. Yeah. And something you said earlier, I wanted to, um, come back to you, you were saying you would, I can't remember how you worded it, but you would worry if there was like no interaction and, um, we're not seeing that either. Like there's just, they're just like, there's a lot of social activity that's going on, which is like the best part of all of this. This is the reason we're doing it. Right. And, um, so in all of those positive interactions kind of like continue to build the relationship. So even if you have like a fight, you have this background of all the, all these positive interactions. But if you have a situation where chimps just really aren't interacting at all, um, then that's kind of a worrisome point. Yes and no. So I've always kind of had the motto of like, they don't have to love each other. They just have to live together. Um, so if they don't want to hang out, that's okay. If they're fighting and then not having some sort of reconciliation, like they come together and they have a battle and then they go their separate ways and they're really their only interaction interactions or conflict. That's, that's an issue for sure. But I, you know, had chimps really, like, yeah, you know, they, they don't think much of one particular other chimp in terms of friendship. They don't hang out with each other. They don't groom, but they also don't argue. I'm okay with that. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> um, yeah, and you had mentioned meal times. There was a specific question about that. Uh, Carol was wondering if there's hassles at meal times with the new nine, or if they're just too busy enjoying food. Um, <laughs> and they you, love their food. For they sure. do. <laughs> Chimps are very, very good at loving their food. Um, but like you pointed out, that is a potential time for competition so we do have to be wary about how how things are going at meal times and we know probably most of our blog readers know we had been stationing Willie B separate from Honeybee and Maeve even in their small group of three because he was a little bit of a bully at meal times and um, would steal food and kind of just cause a little bit of tension with Honeybee and Maeve so and he's fantastic at stationing so he'll just stay in his spot and get his food so we decided to continue that with the with the bigger group, and that's just been fantastic. Um, and he seems to like it, you know. He, he there were some early on. He was like very anxious at meals and just like kind of couldn't calm down. Here's Lulu. Hello. <laughs> um, yeah, and so we we tried to move him like even out of the visual field of the other chimps. So, you know, he could just enjoy his meal and everyone else could enjoy theirs. And, and early on he was like displaying and causing a little bit of drama at meal times, but that's really died down. And oh, good. Um, yeah. Yeah. And we also used to station Gordo cause he would steal food and he hasn't really been doing that, but he also just likes being alone. And so he'll kind of mm -hmm. go to one little spot. And like you were saying, the, the way our setup is there's just a lot of different places for the chimps to be so they can move away from other chimps pretty easily um so yeah meals have been going pretty well i think That's we'll great. probably continue to station will be away from the other chimps for a while it's also whoops um it's <laughs> also been helpful because um uh i forgot what i was gonna say um I think that was screaming on the radio. <laughs> oh, yeah. It can be very distracting. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, he's, You're talking about stationing. Yeah, he's had yeah. some injuries from the fights, so we've been able to spray his injuries and, and treat them with topical um, treatment, uh, which is a little bit easier when there's not, you know, a whole bunch of other people around. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Have you guys done forages with them? Like, do they get scatters yeah, so we in do, the playhouses or greenhouses? We do um, forages after cleaning in the playrooms, uh, just with, like, kind of a low-value low food, like lettuce or kale or something like that. Um, and we usually do that on a daily basis or with seeds, and that hasn't mm -hmm. been an issue. And then lately sure. we've had a couple of different parties 
and have had a little bit higher value food involved in those. And that's gone really well too. Good. That's yeah. great. That's a good yeah. sign. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we're all still just kind of holding our breath even, yeah. you know, anytime we do something new, you know, um, we're just hoping, hoping it goes yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, so obviously, like I was saying, lots of questions about fighting and what we do. So, um, <laughs> One question is like, what, what do we do if a, a fight breaks out? And uh, so if you watched the original video, you saw kind of the explanation that you gave of that, Jen. Um, now that they're spread out, there's not as much that we can do because they're, right. not, they're not as close to us um, and they're not necessarily close to doors. And so um, a lot of it is just uh, hoping that they, they break out and, and that they don't you know, corner any one chimp in a, a spot. So one thing that we have done is we've been making sure that if, you know, they don't have places, they don't have as many places where they can kind of get stuck. Um, so mm -hmm. we have the way the building is, the mezzanine is connected to the front rooms and then the mezzanine is connected to a playroom. And so we make sure all those areas are open um, for them so that they can move pretty free, freely throughout. Um, and yeah, I mean, we watch and if we feel it's necessary, we bring out the hose, although we really haven't done that um, much since the initial um, introductions in the front rooms. And some, and we'll try to separate them if, if we get a chance, if we think it's really severe. But like I said, yeah. we haven't, knock on wood, we haven't done that yeah, <laughs> just <good>. yet. <laughs> um, yeah. So, oh, lots of questions kind of about hierarchy. Um, so we've kind of, we've explained on the blog that it does seem that um, Sai is the boss of the group mm -hmm. and he's a very patient boss. And in the beginning, he let Willie B display a lot and there was, you know, a lot of kind of drama and tension with that. Um, and then he kind of reached a point where he was like, that was, that was too much. <laughs> or he decided that he was in a better position to maybe tell Willie B um, to stop. And Willie B seems okay with that. Um, he doesn't seem to be vying for that top position. Um, so people have questions about like, well, what about, what about the other positions? You know, where's Terry and Gordo and everything? And, and is it, like every single chimp has a particular position in the hierarchy. Have you found that that's the case with chimps? I always feel like it's a bit of a matrix more than just a, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. So, um, you know, their relationships in the wild and free living groups are so fluid because they have this fission fusion where, you know, a few chimps break off and go off and then they reconvene and they go off. Um, and so I, I think that's kind of part of their nature to have very flexible and kind of ever changing relationships. So, I mean, it definitely, I feel like, you know, every group I've worked with has had a male who appears to be the alpha female who appears to be, you know, the most senior female, the alpha female. Um, and very often you can figure out who the second in command is, but I think after that, it's less you know discernible unless you're sitting there and looking at every single individual you know submissive dominant reaction between chimps and in sanctuary we aren't really spending our time doing that necessarily we're busy cleaning and preparing food and preparing enrichment and providing food and and all that other stuff so um i've never like sat down and mapped out like who's number one and two, three, four, five, all the way down to 25. We just kind of know who's generally high ranking and who's generally low ranking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting with the females. Um, like Maeve is definitely a powerful in her group. Um, and rain was considered like not on equal, but it, close to equal status with Sai in the group of six. So I don't know where I would, you know, if I had to put those two against each other, um, what, 
what that would be. But Rain has been so fantastic. Like she, will, like seek her out. Even Aww. Honeybee will be alone, and Rain will go find her and yeah, interact so with her. It really is. Yeah, <laughs> it's really sweet. Rain is definitely like you don't want to mess with her. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and like all of the female chimps are very strong and will display, and you know even little Dora will. Yep. Yeah, I think her delicate flower. Yeah, <laughs> it's now like super super tough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, and you told the story about Maeve, you know, sort of defending Dora's honor from mm-hmm. Terry. and succeeding yeah. in that so yeah mm-hmm. I I almost wonder if that's one of those things that I put too much of a narrative on <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't know exactly what's going on there mm-hmm. um yeah it's interesting I yeah yeah but she displaced Terry so right I mean that's sort of she did she made the Terry, bottom line she made so, Terry stop yeah. what he was doing and she's done it since then um mm-hmm. but then she'll be submissive to Terry yeah yeah it's interesting Um, i mean to me that goes back to they don't have this really solid hierarchy where everyone's got a dominant submissive relationship at all times it's context dependent can be it can change from day to day during the same day so Maeve is powerful enough to displace terry when she wants to and then Mm -hmm. she's smart enough to know when she needs to maybe be a little bit more submissive to him yeah I think that's the bottom line with her. She's just, she's very smart about yeah. social dynamics. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see what other questions we have in here. Um, oh, there was a couple of questions about um, what we were just talking about because Terry has this relationship with Dora that he tries to, um, or he does mate with her mostly at meal time. We're almost always at meal times. Um, so, he hasn't shown, that was the question, he hasn't shown any interest in any other females. Um, and he. If you can has, hear me, Diana, you froze. Okay. Let's see. Can you hear me now? Am I back? You're trying to come back. <laughs> okay. Back fully. A little bit. Hello. Yeah. Um, let's see what other questions we have in here. Um, oh, there was a couple of questions about um, what we were just talking about because Terry has this relationship with Dora that he tries to, um, or he does mate with her mostly at meal time. We're almost always at meal times. Um, so he hasn't shown that was the question. He hasn't shown any interest in any other females. So that's not been an issue. And he still will try to uh, mate with Dora and Maeve will usually try to stop it. So I don't know. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> um, so another question about conflicts. Uh, Jeannie was wondering how long does a caregiver wait uh, before they intervene? And so, um, you know, there's a certain just like level that, fights get to that where you're like okay this is this is a little extreme and we might have to close doors or something um and then i like this question so she's obviously aware that we've been having staff sleepover at night um so she was wondering if uh like when do you wake up jb and diana basically (laughs) uh which i know is a question the staff have been having too but um you know, again, it's like if a conflict reaches that particular level and you feel like, you know, maybe there's going to be a need to close doors, then then they've been calling us up, which hasn't happened too often. Again, knock on wood. It, it was like more frequent in the beginning and then has has tapered, tapered off. Um, and then, you know, it's not that JB and I have any magical powers of being able to <laughs> right. do anything. It's basically just having um, other people there to 
to help me yeah. out if chimps need to be separated or if, they need, hands. Yeah, or if they need um, treatment too. I think that's the, the, that's really the main thing is we wouldn't want a chimp to be injured, you know, in the middle of the night and then not necessarily know about it until hours yeah. later. Yeah. Right. So we're going to move, hopefully, if they're um, at some point, we'll move to monitoring at home, just listening mm-hmm. to the to the monitors. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a good transition step. So. Yeah. 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 There's a question from Kim Harris. She was asking, um, considering that our group is relatively small in number and has a roughly even male to female ratio. And they're similar in older age. What could we expect in terms of hierarchy development? So she was kind of thinking that um, she wouldn't expect that there would be much like jockeying for positions once they have have things kind of settled in this first phase. I mean, I think she's, you know, she's kind of hit the nail right on the head. There's not young up and comers. Um, So very often when there's change in power, it's because a younger male has reached maturity and wants to, you know, rise in power in the group and maybe take over the group. Um, and very often those transfers of power are actually peaceful. I've seen it happen many times where younger males um, take over, but it's because the older males are like, you can have this job. I'm cool with it. <laughs> um, so there's not that dynamic, but at any time, you know, things could change in terms of the relationship with the males who are in this group now. Size an amazing leader. I mean, I was just impressed with him from day one. And it's not just his physical size and stature, but he just is so good at policing. When there's conflict, he, he'll he just, you know, go in and just kind of break everybody apart without using, you know, really much violence for lack of a better term at all and um, he's good at observing and knowing when he needs to step in and when he can let the chimps just kind of work it out on their own so i'm hopeful he's gonna hang on to that position because i don't think any of the other males really have that sophisticated level of of management um, even if they thought that they might want it and then a lot of it depends on who the females support too so and he's got a good relationship with all the females, as far as I can tell. Um, so where, you know, the other males may not have, you know, number one great, amazing relationship with every single female. So I think once they stabilize, I don't think there will be much change in hierarchy um, unless, you know, there was a change in actual group composition. I think that's probably what would trigger something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, when we're just listening, not even watching the cameras, you can tell like, oh, well, there's Willie B like shaking the caging and then tears stomp, 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 stomp. And that's just like mm-hmm. Sai just stomping through. <laughs> yep. And then the, it's quiet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's so good at that. He doesn't, yeah. you know, he doesn't feel the need to like go and like physically put anyone in their place all the time he just knows his presence can he just reminds everyone of his presence yep. like i'm here right. and i will intervene if i need to but don't make me <laughs> so <laughs> then they yeah. seem to be pretty good about about respecting him yeah he's pretty awesome he really is yeah yeah um yeah so there's one question uh, there were a couple of questions kind of unrelated that I think I'll just answer separately later about Negra getting hurt, which isn't really mm-hmm. about the yeah. integration. Um, but there was one from Marcy. She was wondering, since the final integration is going well, when will it be safe to start adding more enrichment toys like scooters and workbenches and stuff? Um, and was wondering if uh, conflicts happen over possessions of toys but maybe kind of having the extra enrichment is helpful because it, you know, is mentally stimulating. Um, so I think that she's very observant that we haven't had some of those things in, in with the larger group. And there's actually a couple of reasons for that. And one is the group of six um, have been ingesting some plastic materials and rubber materials since they got here. 
so we've been really careful about what, what we've given them. Um, so that's part of it. We have restricted what they're getting because of that. And then the other thing is there is a, not necessarily a, necessarily a competition um, fear, but things that make a lot of noise <laughs> can just kind of escalate stuff. So um, I've limited certain materials because of that too. Like there were, we gave out PVC tubes one night and it was sort of like, just breaking across the caging from three until seven in the morning. Yep. <laughs> um, and so, you know, we're hoping that we can reintroduce some of that stuff when things calm down a little bit more. Um, yes. There's been many chimps I know who like, this group can only have soft toys because this one chimp will just scrape things across the concrete all day long and display and cause conflict. Um, yeah. And it's amazing how objects can trigger that behavior. Like we want them to display because it's normal yeah. behavior. Um, but when it becomes almost an obsession and it's what that chimp is focused on doing for almost all of their day and causing unnecessary conflict within their group. And you can stop that conflict by giving them soft toys that they can't rake across the concrete. Like that's, that's perfectly fine. Yeah. So. And Have some objects had... can be used as weapons. Um, right. And so it's, you know, maybe we don't need to provide that in particular to them, especially in the early stages when they're still working things out on their own. Right. Yeah. Have you ever known female chimps to rake? Off the top of my head, I can't think of, I'm sure I have. I can't think of anyone in particular, but it does yeah. seem to be um, males who really, really love to do that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, you know, the the Gombe chimps, Jane Good, the chimps mm -hmm. Jane Goodall observed this famous example of her bringing in metal drums that were filled with vegetable oil or something to that extent, and the chimps discovered that ooh, these are noisy, and the males use them in their displays, and it just made them seem a lot more powerful. So right. right. They do love all that noisy stuff. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, and like you're saying, sometimes it's fine. You know. Mm -hmm often it's fine and it'll be like you know like the barrels that we have um with jamie and burrito like they'll display with them and throw them around and then it'll be over it's not yeah. like that constant um yeah yeah you do have to think of the other chimps in the group i mean they show signs that it agitates them or annoys them and so it's like, yes, this one chimp may need to display and okay, let's give them opportunities to do that. But if it's going to be displaying all day long and upsetting the other chimps, so it's not fair to the other chimps either. So I yeah. just have to try to find a balance. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. And actually that uh, reminds me of another topic. So we were finding that Willie B was kind of doing that in the middle of the night and just was really having a hard time settling down and you know, for days and days on end was, he was keeping everyone else up at night, which I think mm. was, you know, like any human who has sleep deprivation, it, like you, you get just like more irritated during the day. Yeah. And so we did make the decision to give him some medication at night. We um, started him on trazodone after a lot of discussion with the staff, because we, you know, it's not a flippant um, decision, mm -hmm. um, to give a chimp medication for kind of a behavioral right. issue. Um, but I don't know if you wanted to talk a little bit more about your views on that. Yeah, sure. So I'm definitely in favor of using medication to help chimps basically integrate into groups or feel more relaxed or feel more comfortable. Um, and, you know, you can call it modifying behavior. It is modifying their behavior, but if it's providing a pathway to them living with a family, feeling less anxiety, feeling less stress, um, it can be very beneficial. I would never want to give a chimp medication to the point where they could not behave normally, where they were zonked out or, you know, a zombie all day long or not able to think clearly or appear to be able to make good decisions. Um, it really is just about taking the edge off. None of these chimps have had an opportunity for what we would call a normal life. They lived, grew up alone. They lived in concrete boxes. They were experimented on. They have experienced a lot of stress and a lot of mistreatment. And any human 
in that situation would probably need some medication to cope with that situation. And I think chimps are, um, they have a lot more, I think, endurance than we do. Um, they impress me that way all the time. But, um, but I think we actually kind of owe it to them to use all the tools at our disposal to, to help them um, enjoy a more enriched and full life that they were meant to, meant to live. Yeah, I think that's such a good way of putting it because we are using all these other tools like separating Willie B during meals or, you know, not giving certain materials if that's going to cause a problem. And so I I think my views on medication have changed over time. Um, and I really do view it as, um, you know, it's not the first thing that you go to necessarily, but if it's still an issue, it's something that we can provide for them. Um, and it's not, it's generally not a long-term, um, solution either. It's kind of to get past a, a particular situation, unless you do have a chimp who is, you know, has, a you know, um, like post-traumatic stress disorder or, you know, something that is just really does need um, consistent treatment, which is absolutely possible. And, and what a great thing that we are able to help them. Yeah, exactly. I never see it. It's always for their benefit and not for our convenience. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not to make our lives as caregivers easier It's to make their lives easier. And if, if, if a tablet will help them, why not try? I, yeah. I've always been in favor of, of giving them every chance um, using everything that we have at our disposal um, to improve their lives. Yeah. Good. Did you have anything else you wanted to? Not that I can say think of off the top of my head. So, I mean, it was, like I said, it went so much faster getting mm -hmm. the nine together and I mean, the team was amazing. Everyone just was, whether or not maybe internally they were on board, they at least <laughs> seemed to be on board and uh, were willing to move forward. And the chimps kind of went along with that flow. And I was just really thrilled with, with how it went and pleasantly surprised with how it went. And, and you all did it and they did it. So I think everyone should be really, really proud of themselves. So it was a pleasure for me to be around chimps as always. Yeah. Well, I mean, we couldn't have done it without you, for sure. Um, that last step was just, it was really, really hard um, yeah. because of our, our experience before, mostly. And just because it's hard. Like, it's not easy. It's, for, it's not easy for anybody, yeah. right? It's no. not, unless you are totally shut off from your emotions. Right. Like, <laughs> exactly. It's going to be a challenge. Um, but we've seen so many really amazing things. And I think every day I hear a staff member say, like, I'm just so proud of the chimps. And, oh, you know, we'll have a story awesome. about something that they saw. Like, well, this could have escalated, but it didn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, or just, like, cute videos that we're sharing with each other. And yeah. It's just really heartwarming to be able to give them a better life. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. So yeah. thank you for doing it. So thanks for being there for them. Cause yeah. Who knows where they would be without you all. Well, thank you. Thank you for being with for so many chimps over the years. <laughs> You're welcome. My pleasure, always. Mm -hmm.